Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of Statistical Know-How with Dr. Norman Rogers. Today we're going to be talking about a very important topic, which is bridging theory and data are very, very important for all young scientists to understand. But before we can talk about linking theory with data, let us talk for a minute about what it means to progress. How do we know if science is progressing? How do we know if psychology is progressing? Well, one definition I'm particularly fond of is it is the degree to which theory and data become interconnected, interdependent, interreliant. When the two become connected, we have progress. Very, very important to understand. Now let's think about situations where data and theory are not integrated. So let's suppose that someone believes that vaccinations cause autism, a ridiculous idea. Here, the theory that vaccinations cause autism is not supported by the data. Time and time again, the data shows there is no relationship between the two. Let's consider another example. Let's say someone's engine is making a noise. A clunk, 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 clunk. You don't know where it's coming from, and you don't know why. So here, the data, the noise, has no supporting theory. In, in such a situation, how can you possibly expect we shall progress, make a repair, make things better? It can't happen. Data and theory must be integrated. Let us consider a third and final example. Roy Baumeister, the famed social psychologist, developed a theory of what he calls ego depletion. We will talk more about this later. Well, in Baumeister's theory, what they attempted to do was that the registered replication report across 10 independent studies from 10 independent labs, they attempted to replicate some of the basic findings of ego depletion. And what did they find? Well, quite disappointing indeed if you're Roy Baumeister. What they found was an average effect size basically near zero. So here, again, the theory is strong. It makes sense, it's a very beautiful theory. But the data support is weak at best in non-existent at worst. So now I'm talking to you, young students. What is your role? You're a scientist after all. So how do you fit into the greater picture of science? How do you ensure that you progress the field of psychology? Well, think about it this way, your introduction what is that but none other than a story where you are crafting the theory behind the predictions that you are making? And what is your results section? Well, nothing more than the data that supports or fails to support your theory. Do you understand? And what is your discussion? Well, your discussion is your attempt to tie the data, your results section, with the existing theory, your introduction. So your discussion is where you make an evaluative judgment call. You built the framework with the introduction, you display the results in your, in your results section, and then you tie them in in the discussion. And here you decide and describe how the data and the theory are integrated. How have we advanced? Now, allow me to talk about common problems I see. And Professor Fife, if you want to jump in at any point. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, I'd love to. I'm going to talk about common problems I see. Now, you've read a lot of papers, haven't you? Yeah, countless papers. I mean, 
you know, I've taught research methods several times and I certainly read a lot of student papers. So you can, you can certainly back me up on these. Oh, I, yeah, I, I've heard what you said and I agree 100%. Excellent, excellent. So what I, what, the way that I see it is your introduction is you're crafting the story, am I right? Well, that's exactly what it is. You know, your introduction is the story of your theory. Exactly. And so in the introduction, you provide the theoretical justification for your hypothesis. Now, some questions to consider. Does your intro lead to your hypothesis? Now, let me, let me just interrupt here. And I've, I've seen this countless times where somebody writes, beautiful introductory section gives strong theory. And then they include this one sentence that says, now nobody has studied this before. And it leads me to believe, well, maybe nobody studied it because it's not a very good thing to study. Exactly, exactly, yes. I've seen the same thing. And so you need to provide a better rationale than, hey, nobody's studied this before and I'm filling a gap in the literature and so I guess this is it. No. Your introduction needs to point to how you're going to develop the theory. Exactly. And in addition to that, you're hypothesis needs to point to specific procedures. If you craft this beautiful story and then write the hypothesis where somebody reads it and says, I have no idea how to evaluate that. Well, that's a problem, wouldn't you say? Oh yeah, exactly. Very big problem. And I see it very frequently. So let's talk about an example story and an example hypothesis. So let's say, I'm just going to read verbatim from the PowerPoint here. Baumeister suggested that individuals have limited resources to exercise self-control, and these resources dwindle over time, but can be replenished with glucose. So according to this theory, those who are hypoglycemic should have lower self-control. Okay, yeah, that is a beautifully crafted introduction, beautifully crafted rationale for why we are going to hypothesize what we're going to hypothesize. Now let's go ahead and see how it fails. Yes, let's, let's see that indeed. So this hypothesis might be there exists a significant relationship between self-control, hypoglycemicness, and experimental conditions. Now that's just bad. That's poor. Okay? Because it doesn't follow from the story. You have this beautiful story. You have this beautiful theory. And then it all falls apart at the hypothesis. And it does not point to a specific procedure. Exactly. So I'm reading this. I'm saying, all right, we got self-control, we got hypoglycemic, and we've got experimental condition. Okay, so are you interested in the main effect between experimental condition and hypoglycemic? The main effect between experimental condition and self-control? The interaction effect? the or what is the dependent variable here what is the independent variable now granted that's clear from the intro introduction section but at the same time it doesn't point to a specific hypothesis what parameter are you interested in exactly so you might modify it to say we hypothesize that hypoglycemic interacts with experimental condition such that those with hypoglycemia in the control condition will perform no better than those without hypoglycemia in the experimental condition. Now this is good. Yes, that's excellent. So that tells you that we're looking at an interaction effect here. And it's not just saying that the interaction effect is significant. It's identifying exactly how that interaction effect is significant. That those who are hypoglycemic in the control will perform just as well as those without hypoglycemia in the experimental condition. And you could test that specific hypothesis. That is precise, that is specific, and that follows exactly from the story. Yes, yes, it does. It follows very well from the story. And so at this point, the audience should know why you're testing what you're testing, which is what the introduction says, and how you're going to test it, which is what the hypothesis is. So now, Let's talk more fully about this idea of mapping theory to data. So one way we can map theory to data is provide a well-crafted hypothesis. Now, one of the strengths of null hypothesis significance testing at NHST is that it provides a translational mechanism, as Cortina said. In other words, it provides a very clear map from theory to data and back again. So it provides an objective criteria that if P is less than 0.05, 
the hypothesis is supported. Otherwise, it is not. You can't get more simpler than that. That is, as Cortina said again, a translational mechanism. It translates the theory into the data. And so let's look at an example, shall we? People can act more powerfully without having power. Researchers and practitioners advise people to obtain alternatives in social exchange relationships to enhance their power. However, alternatives are not always readily available, often forcing people to interact without having much power. Building on research suggesting that subjective power and objective outcomes are disconnected and that mental stimulation can improve aspirations, we test whether mental imagery of a strong alternative can provide some of the benefits that real alternatives provide. We hypothesize that those who engage in mental stimulation will acquire more positive benefits in a negotiation simulation than those who do not. So again, that provides a beautiful story with a well-crafted hypothesis and According to traditional rules, if P is less than 0.05 and whatever parameter that is that we are testing, the theory is supported. Otherwise, the theory is not. Simple, am I right? Yes, yes, exactly. So on the other hand, so P less than 0.05 provides an excellent, excellent translational mechanism, but it does have its flaws. It is a very poor operational definition. For the following reasons, as well as many others, one is that it does not mean that the results will generalize. So if you look at this image at the right, on the left axis here, it shows p-values across 20 different, no, 26, I'm sorry, 26 different replications of a study. This is simulated data. Now this is a result that should be statistically significant because the effect is actually there. This is a simulation, we know the effect is there. And so how many times out of 26 do we actually get statistically significant results? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Not even half of the time is there a statistically significant difference between the two groups that we have simulated. And so if you are one of the lucky chaps, who was able to get this p-value less than 0 0.001, you would be inclined to say, wow, I have discovered something. My theory is proven. And I guarantee that it will always be there. You might believe that. But it's actually not true. As you can see here, so 11 times out of 26, a significant p-value was not obtained. In addition to that reason for it being a poor operational definition of theory data integration, it provides very little evidence that the null is false. Because when we test a p-value, we identify the probability of the data assuming the null hypothesis is true. And in our minds, sometimes we believe we are providing the probability that the null hypothesis is true given the data that we've observed and that is not true these two quantities are not the same for example you can consider the probability of death given a shark bite well that might be quite high with infection or depending on how severe the wound is you might say that the probability of death given a shark bite might be 30 percent i don't know i just made that number up on the other hand, what is the probability of shark bite given death? You go to a mortuary, you start pulling out the death records, and you say, all right, what percentage of these people have died by shark bite? Do you think it would be 30%? I doubt it, unless you happen to be at a mortuary next to a beach. The two quantities are not equal. We would expect the second quantity to be much, much less. Most people do not die from shark bites. Thankful to say, because I love the water. <laughs> yeah, I totally with you. So, another problem with P less than 0.05 is it provides even less evidence for the alternative. So we see here that a P value does not provide very much evidence for the null hypothesis or against the null hypothesis, and it's even further removed from the probability of the alternative hypothesis. On the other hand, 
effect sizes do tend to be consistent across replications. And so now let's look again at this figure at the right. So the dots here represent the, fix, the effect sizes across the 26 studies, along with confidence intervals. And you see that on average, so here the dotted line is the average effect, on average the effect size tends to stay pretty close to 10, which is the actual effect size for the experiment. So why do we use effect size, or why do we not use effect sizes as our operational definition of significance when p-values has such limitations? So then you might ask, all right, Professor Rogers, Professor Fife, how then do we link theory with data? If we can't use p-values, if they're not the best bridge to build, what then is a good bridge? Well, we need a bridge with substance. And that bridge is our hypothesis. And so the question then becomes, how do we craft excellent hypotheses that avoid many of the problems of p-values? So let's go ahead and review the handout, shall we? Your professor posted on Blackboard many of the let, shall we say, um, guidelines, suggestions, and so forth for crafting hypotheses. And I'll go ahead and pull this up. And I'm not going to read every detail in here, but I strongly advise that you do. I've read the thing myself and I find it quite brilliant. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate that. I'm flattered, especially coming from you, Dr. Rogers, as, uh, as uh, accomplished as you are as a scholar. Oh, stop the flattery. All right, so good hypotheses bridge data to theory, whereas bad hypotheses are divorced from theory data or both. Good hypotheses point to specific statistical tools and procedures. Good hypotheses are often formulated in terms of model comparisons, as opposed to the bad hypotheses that they are crafted in the language of a null hypothesis. You might find, for example, in the literature, people predict that there will be a statistically significant difference between two groups. Well, again, that's crafted, that's language crafted in null hypothesis significance testing language, as opposed to formulated in model comparison language. So here's an example. You might say, we hypothesize that predicting history of assault with Hostile masculinity will yield better predictions than a model predicting with hostile sexism. That is a model comparison question. Much better than statistical significance. Good research questions and good hypotheses build upon the existing literature, and they advance theoretical understanding of the construct of interest. On the other hand, bad hypotheses merely fill a gap. Good hypotheses are often stated with direction, form, and or size. So here's an example. We'll talk about this a little more later. You might say we expect hostile sex... So blah, blah, blah. Forgive my blunder there. We expect hostile sexism scores among those with a history of sexual assault to be greater than 0.8 standard deviations higher than those who do not have a history of assault. We also hypothesize that a model with hostile masculinity will yield greater than a 10% improvement in classifying those with a history of sexual assault than the hostile sexism model. So here we have specific numbers as opposed to, again, a hypothesis that says that there is merely a significant difference. And finally, again, we will talk more about this later, it sets the criteria for evidential strength based on statistics that are relevant to the topic being studies, studied. So as an example, if improvement in classification is no more than 10% for the HS model relative to the HM model, we will consider the HM model superior. So we are setting a decision criteria in advance that is divorced from p-values. It is using classification accuracy. And here's another example. Also, if the upper limit of the 
percent confidence interval of Cohen's D does not exceed 0.8, we will conclude the evidence is weak that HS is higher among those with a history of sexual assault. So again, we are setting the decision criteria based on other statistics. As opposed to the standard way of doing things, we set criteria for evidential strength based strictly on p-values. So now I'm going to give you a turn to practice. Go ahead, turn off the video, take some time, and using the abstracts I have shown on Blackboard, I want you to number one, write out the statistical model using regression notation. If you're not familiar with that means, that's okay. We will talk about this later, but for those of you who understand what that means, write it out, write out the statistical model using regression notation. Step number two, Identify the parameter, not the procedure of interest, but the parameter of interest in the regression model. Is it the main effect of one variable? Is it the main effect of another? Is it the interaction term? Is it the slope? Number three, craft a poor hypothesis. And then number four, craft a good hypothesis. Be prepared to answer the following questions when you arrive at class. What are your take-home messages from the previous practice? And how exactly will that influence your personal research? Part two. Welcome back again. So today, right now, we're gonna be talking about crafting strong hypotheses. So previously we talked about crafting strong specific hypotheses and here we specify the value that you will test against. So as you are performing a literature review, ah, oh, forgive me, my, my effing flipping dog will not shut her mouth and stop barking and it is really driving me bonkers. I'm trying to record a video here. My goodness, every stranger that walks by, she will go, she's got to bark her snout off. Give me one moment, please. Goodness, for the love of Queen Elizabeth, my deepest and sincerest apologies for that. Now, where was I? Oh, that's right. So, when you are crafting a paper, you are going to lead, read the literature so you could develop your hypothesis within the context of the existing literature, literature. And so as you are crafting this, you will encounter many findings. And from there, you should be able to detect and specify in advance Many of these types of strong hypotheses, direction for example, you can identify whether the variables of interest are positively correlated or does the control group have higher scores. Again, we're talking about the direction of the effect. In addition to that, we may be able to glean from the literature the form of the effect. Is the relationship curvilinear? Is it linear? Is it exponential? Unfortunately, many of the literature do not even test for these sorts of things, but sometimes you can identify it, like if they display a scatter plot, for example. So we have direction, we have form, we have pattern. So let's say, for example, that you have three groups. You might be able to identify from the literature that one group consistently outperforms group two, and group two consistently outperforms the third group. So do the group means form a pattern? Or when you increase the dosage, is there a particular pattern in the reduction of symptoms? And then finally, the way that we could get the most precise is to identify the size. What exactly is the value of the estimate of interest? 0.4? Is the correlation coefficient 0.6? Is Cohen's D 1.2? Based on the literature, we may not be able to identify the exact size of it. That would be likely impossible. But we could at least identify the approximate range of the sizes that we would expect. And then from there, we can set a decision criteria. So what is a decision criteria? Now, keep in mind, it is not always necessary to make a decision. But for some reason, some people feel the need to make a decision. 
Is this theory supported or is it not? Should this intervention be used or should it not? So the common way to decide whether finding have merit, either theoretically or as an in intervention, is to use the criteria of p less than 0 0.05. If p is less than 0 0.05, then the theory is supported. If it's greater than 0 0.05, then the theory is not supported. That becomes, again, our operational definition. The advantages, as I said, it is objective. Everybody can agree on it. It is outside of the researcher's control, which means it cannot be manipulated. All researchers have a vested interest in their own studies being significant. And so by removing the opportunity for a researcher to specify what significance is of their own, we have made it harder for them to fudge the results, so to say. And another advantage is it provides a clear map from theory to data. However, as we have mentioned, there are disadvantages. It is not very diagnostic. It does not tell you about the, P, the probability of the null hypothesis or the probability of the alternative hypothesis. It's not a very good, oh, what is the term? Litmus test. It yields very little information about the questions we really want to know. But in addition, it provides, it puts some disciplines or sub-disciplines at a disadvantage. In the field of epidemiology, it is quite common to have thousands upon thousands upon thousands of participants. Whereas for clinical trials, it is rare to have more than 30 participants. In neuropsychology, it's even worse because the expensive are so, the machines are so expensive to operate. And yet we use a p-value, a statistic that is so sensitive to sample size, to make the same decisions across all these sub-disciplines. Is that not unfair? If it is unfair, then why do we do it? So what I'm suggesting is that researchers set their own decision criteria. Well, you might object, well, if they put it in their own decision criteria, what's to stop them from saying, well, I observed a correlation coefficient of 0. 0.0004, and my decision criteria was zero. It's greater than zero, therefore it is significant. Well, of course that is problematic, but here's how we get around that. Remember that your decision criteria are open for public scrutiny. These should be identified at pre-registration, and if you set such a low bar to overpass, then certainly you're going to lower your chances of publishing your results after the fact. Nobody's going to tolerate such low decision criteria, and people have to defend their own decision criteria, so it's going to require a lot more forethought in advance. And in my mind, and in the minds of many theologians, not theologians, that's silly, of many theoreticians, many philosophers, that's how science is supposed to work. People are supposed to argue, people are supposed to defend things, scrutinize things, criticize things. But when we use a universal p-value, it invites people to deflect blame. Well, it's not my fault I published a faulty study. P was less than 0.05. That's the convention. Therefore, it's not my fault. Well, that's problematic and silly indeed. So let's put the decision-making back in the hands of the researcher and hold them responsible for whatever they produce. So how then do we set our own decision criteria? Well, we can set it in two ways. One is we could specify a minimum effect size that we care about. For example, you might say, if the difference between groups is less than 0.2 standard deviations, I don't even care about it. It's so small, it's not hardly worth bothering over. Conversely, after you have done a literature review, as I mentioned, you might have a pretty good idea of how large the estimate is. And so you might instead say, based on our aggregation from the literature, we estimate the difference between those with and without believed power will be between $200 and $400 in a simulated negotiation. If our 
estimate is less than $200, we will conclude the groups are not different enough to support the theory. Now that is a good hypothesis and a good decision criteria. And I hope, it is my hope, that this may become much more common in practice to do these sorts of decision criteria. Now let's consider the judgment context. It is exceedingly problematic, in my opinion, that decisions should ever be made from a single study. You craft this beautiful hypothesis, and then you have one study, just one study, and from that you want to conclude a universal finding that is preposterous to me. Nothing is ever conclusive. Nothing. Data has variability, especially in psychology. Instead, your decision, instead of being, your decision being based on a single study, it should be based on three things. What does the past literature say? And again, this informs your decision criteria and places your research within a context. So after reviewing the past literature, you can have some context in understanding what the past literature says. And then you observe the statistics from your own study. What do your statistics say? These statistics that you have decided in advance are the relevant statistics. And at this point, this should be fairly objective if you have set a decision criteria at pre-registration. And then finally, we cannot ignore this. What do the graphics say? It is easy to lie to yourself or to your audience with statistics, but it is nearly impossible to lie with graphics. So based on what the past literature says, based on what the statistics say, and based on what the graphics say, we are then far more prepared to make a judgment call. But even then, let's say our theory quote-unquote wins. We surpass the decision criteria, the literature supports it, our data supports it, the graphics supports it. Then what happens? Well, then the judgment be call becomes the new current status. That is, until somebody else comes along and builds upon what we have done or contradicts what we have done. Remember, everything is provisional. Nothing is ever conclusive. You must treat all you see with skepticism. And that includes your very own findings. It requires a great deal of humanity. I meant to say humility, but humanity works too. It takes a great deal of humility to look at your own findings and be skeptical of them. But that's what you ought to do. That's what we must do if science is to progress. And then we must challenge all supposed truth. And most importantly, trust no one. Only kidding. Kind of. So now it is time for you to develop some practice. Using your best judgment, based on what you've learned from the literature, develop a precise hypothesis for your tested effect. Whatever it is you're doing this semester, develop a precise hypothesis. Make sure to follow the guidelines I've given you in the paper. In the following week, please be prepared to answer the following questions. From this practice, what are your take-home messages? How will this influence your own personal research? Now, let me make one final comment. Ladies and gentlemen, let's be practical. I, well, really, your professor, Dr. Fife, am I right? Yes, yes, this is all me. In, in fact, maybe I sh should I take this one? Yes, I, I think it might be better because it's coming from you anyway. Yeah, yeah, I'll go ahead and take this one. All right, guys, let's be practical. I know that this is very different from the way that you have been taught in the past and probably very different from the way your advisors will do it. And for that reason, I will not insist that every paper that you write have these sorts of hypotheses. There are standard ways of doing things, and any time you try to resist the standard way of doing things, you might have editors, advisors, or, res or reviewers who may resist. But the problem is, psych is currently not cumulative. A Cumulative-minded strategy may be hard to do, but I think it's worth it. That's where we need to be. And here's what I'm doing. I'm inviting you to do one of the following, and this is listed in hierarchical order from least 
awesome to most awesome. Least awesome would be do this for your own personal benefit. And I promise it'll make a more informed decision when you come down to that point. But you're going to write your paper using standard NHST language. If you want to be a little more bold, what you could do is write it in your paper with this new way of writing hypotheses. And then you can remove it if there's any resistance. If you want to be even more bold, write it in your paper. I don't know that this is necessarily more bold than the second one, but write it in your paper, then add NHST language in addition. So you have both of them there. And finally, the most bold of all, to hell with reviewers, editors, and advisors. Do what you want. Not really. But really. But not really. Yeah, you get the idea. So in review, you mind if I take this one, Professor Rogers? Oh, of course, please. So in review, characteristics of good hypotheses. They bridge theory to data. They're going to point to specific statistical techniques. They build upon existing literature. They are stated with a direction, which is good, a form or pattern, which is even better, and best, they're stated with a particular size. And then it sets the criteria based on relevant statistics that are not p-values. And finally, of course, there will be resistance. So thank you for joining uh, me today, and as well as Professor Rogers. Thank you, Professor Rogers, for joining us. Uh, you've been most helpful. Oh, it is always my pleasure. And until the next time, ladies and gentlemen, yes, until the next time, thank you for tuning in, and we will talk to you soon. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye now.